Good evening, everyone, and welcome to The Real Science Exchange, the podcast where leading scientists and industry professionals beat over a few drinks to discuss the latest ideas and trends in animal nutrition. Hi, I'm Scott Sorrell, one of your hosts here tonight at The Real Science Exchange. Tonight's conversation will be discussing what's causing our cows to exit the herd as they age and the impact that that has on the dairy producer's uh, profitability. Joining us at the pub tonight is a decorated group of experts ready to share an in-depth look and the impact of cow longevity. Uh, Dr. Ian Lean, let's start with you. You recently shared a popular webinar on the subject of cow longevity during the Real Science Lecture Series. We're excited to welcome you and your guests to the exchange tonight. Well, thanks, Scott. Um, yeah, it was a pretty interesting uh, webinar and some terrific questions, but I, I'm really uh, chuffed to have... Uh, both uh, my old friend Todd Duffield and uh, uh, Stephen LeBlanc, who is also an old friend, uh, along with us to uh, kind of chat about what we did. Very well. Why don't you go ahead and, and introduce your uh, your guest for us? Uh, and how did you guys meet? And I know that uh, at least one of them's had a sabbatical with you. Maybe talk a little bit about that. Well, gosh, I think uh, uh, maybe Todd can remember, but uh, he's professor at... Uh, Guelph and so is Stephen. So they're both um, highly decorated uh, the scientists there at, um, at at Guelph in Canada. So we sort of got a, a, a Commonwealth of Nations type talk at the moment, and we'll see if Jose manages to crash crash the show. But um, we've uh, we met, uh, I think, in uh, Red Deer, Alberta, Todd, uh, at a at a meeting uh, back. No, no it wasn't it was Red Deer. It was I, well. You did say I was old. Um, it, it, it was. It was before that meeting. I think Ian go way back to when ADSA was in Guelph. Um, oh gosh! You know, yeah. back before we were having you know the big conferences in, with you know where they have big convention centers. So one of the last uh, meetings, maybe the last meeting that they had at a university, was held in Guelph, and that was uh, the year I finished my DVSC. Um, which was in 97. And we both spoke at a, there was a, a special um, separate, con in conjunction with D ADSA, there was a symposium and you and I were both uh, speaking on the program and that's the first time I, I met you. I had read all of your papers, uh, you know, because they were relevant to my, my thesis work. And uh, so I was quite excited to meet you and we were both on the same program. So, so we met then and then uh that's right you continue to meet at uh, adsa meetings and and like scott said you know i had the pleasure of uh spending eight months in australia as part of a study leave and ian and i collaborated on some great meta analysis work and uh, so it's been a it's been a long friendship but it started quite a while ago yeah super one of, one of the real joys has been watching todd's kids grow up it's just <laughs> been fantastic it's uh you know they're such great guys and uh you know, they, they, they were a lot of fun when they were down. And, you know, similarly, actually, Jose did a, a sabbatic with us, and it's been just fantastic watching his kids grow up too. So it's one of the joys of how, having uh, those sort of long-term relationships. And then, and also at that same meeting, Todd, uh, that was where I kind of uh, continued a friendship with Bill Chalupa. And uh, Bill, Bill spoke also on that meeting and... Uh, you know, I still miss Bill, and he was mentioned the other day in the Mike Van Amberg thing, and it kind of was very cool that, uh, you know, Bill got a, a call out there. But but Stephen, Stephen and I, I, I don't know when we first met Steve. I, we, we had a lovely time in Chile rapping, and I think I got into trouble because I delivered a plenary, and, and I was kind of out of the room when I got called out. And, and uh, yeah, I was chatting to you, but I think that was better than, you know, a pat on the back, so. <laughs> maybe we've yeah. met before then briefly but yeah that's yeah I, I, that's that's right so that would have been 2010 probably at the at the Buiatrix congress but yeah you know i, I mean you, you'd mentioned two old friends i i, I just want to make sure that that everyone understands that i'm a little bit less old than todd so that that's the first <laughs> important point but um but um, yeah, no, it's it's been a long time, and you know, I do feel like a little bit like the poor country cousin because you know I'm the only one who hasn't done a sabbatical in Australia um, with you, and and sort of uh, learned at the foot of the uh, of the master. But no, it's it's been a, a good long time, and Ian and I uh, and a whole bunch of other people were 
back in what was it the mid 2013 14 15 um did the uh the reporting guidelines for repro related studies with matt lucy and a whole bunch of other people and uh, uh that was I, I don't know i guess that was geek fun wasn't it but uh yeah hopefully some useful work and lots of shared interests since then steven i'm so old uh i'm old enough to be your graduate co-supervisor that's true. That's true. Now, you know, just for the record, Todd was was only 14 when when <laughs> but, uh, yeah. <laughs> Gentlemen, uh, this is great fun already. Uh, one one of the things we like to do uh, at the beginning here is right to, to kind of live up to our, our, our pub theme. So I'll, I'll ask each, each of you to tell us what's in your glass tonight. Uh, Ian, let's start with you. Now, I, I, I have a feeling this might be a little different. Well, I'm I'm going to tell you because I've shared many a good one with with Todd and Jose that I'd by preference have a a nice Hunter Valley Shiraz in my glass, but but truthfully at seven a.m. in the morning here, <laughs> I've got yeah. I've had a coffee. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, I understand completely. We are we have uh, guests from all over the uh, the world. We've got Ian there in uh, in Australia or, or New Zealand. Uh, Two gentlemen here in Canada. We're waiting on Dr. Santos, who's traveling in Germany. He said he'd like to stop by the pub, but uh, we'll see if he makes it. Um, Stephen, what's in your glass tonight? Uh, so it's it, the sun is over the yard arm here in in Guelph, and uh, so I'm having uh, a wee dram of uh, Macallan Scotch. Yeah, what year? I, I don't know what year it was distilled, but it's it was 12 years old when it went it's into the years. bottle. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Good. And, and Todd and you. Cheers. Uh, I'm enjoying a Hazy Days IPA brewed at uh, the Cowbell Brewery in uh, in Blythe, Ontario, and uh, a favorite spot of mine when uh, my son and I go fly fishing uh, between Blythe and Godrich for smallmouth bass in the summer. Um, Excellent. But being uh, also, uh, in addition to a faculty member, a chair of the department, it has, in fact, been a hazy day. And so um, much enjoying this beverage. Yeah, awesome. Very well. Uh, we have one other gentleman that uh, we have not introduced yet here to the pub. Uh, my co-host for tonight, Dr. Peter Morrow. Pete's quickly becoming an expert at the exchange uh, as he's co-hosted several of these for us now. Uh, Pete, thanks for jumping in uh, for us and helping us uh, behind a computer so what's in your glass tonight, Pete? I'm having a vodka lemonade. Oh, very nice. Very, very nice. nice. Very tasty. Sounds refreshing. For me, um, when Stephen said he was doing a Macallan, I had just a little bit left uh, in my cabinet. I've got a lot of rye going on in my cabinet right now, but I did have a little bit of uh, scotch, and I decided I'm going to share a Macallan with you. So uh, cheers uh, to uh, Dr. Lean. Thank you very much for joining us tonight. Cheers. Thanks. Cheers, all. Tonight's PubCast stories are brought to you by Reassure Precision Release Choline. Reassure is the most researched encapsulated choline on the market today, consistently delivering results to your transition cows of higher peak milk, reduced metabolic disorders, and even in utero benefits to her calf leading to growth and health improvements. Visit balchem.com to learn more. Cheers. All right. And to kind of get us started here, I... Uh, this all uh, sprang from a presentation you gave at the uh, recent ADSA meeting, and I think it was a culmination of some uh, from a meta-analysis that you'd done and worked on with uh, the gentleman that's on the call with us. Can you give us a little bit of background and some of the key findings uh, of the research that you shared there at the ADSA? Yeah, sure. Um, I guess uh, this sort of the genesis came um, from some work that uh, Dr. Golder and I were doing over in uh, in, in the US and then also some studies in Australia where we started looking at herd structure and uh, being pretty pretty surprised that, you know, we had a lot of uh, heifers there and uh, relatively few older cows and thought, well, you know, let's have a look at that because these cows seem to be disappearing a bit faster than they should. So we, uh, I contacted, uh, you know, Stephen and Todd and Jose and said, hey, you know, what do you think? Let's pull some of these big data sets we've done over time and 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 let's have a look at some serious questions here because, you know, it's it's hard to find really good quality data sets, particularly around cow removal and reproduction. So 
um, because there have been an interest in some of our other studies, I knew that we'd all have pretty good data in that area and that's where we went. So, you know, the major things we found was that the older cows were disappearing much faster in terms of removal. They had much higher rates of risks of disease. I mean, some of the risks are quite extraordinary. Uh, you know, if you take parity two cows versus, you know, those of parity five and greater, you know, they're 20 and 30 times more likely to be removed for hypocalcemia. Um, you know, if you uh, look at some of those things like um, lameness, for example, parity one versus parity five and greater is six times. Um, the, the diseases weren't necessarily absolutely always that the older cows were at risk. There were some disorders that the younger cows were at risk of, you know, like, um, you know, dystochia. Um, but then the, the really interesting stuff, and I'll probably let Stephen talk more about the reproduction because, you know, the reproduction's really, really interesting. Um, we've, we've looked at the data in a different way to most people. And, and I think in doing that, we've found some really cool insights. Um, but the thing that kind of nailed this to the wall for me in terms of really giving me a deep feeling for, for where the problems lie is in the metabolic data. So we had the disease data, we had the reproduction data, and then the metabolic data showed that these cows were just different to the younger cows. So even though we've got a lot of cows that are left the herd, right? We're looking at the survivors. So there's a real bias in the sort of data we're looking at. But when we kind of look at that, we say, hey, these are not able to maintain their blood calciums. They've got higher ketones, they've got higher fatty acids. And, and then that's kind of anomalous because you've got those animals that as they age, you go from an animal being much more likely to be in a high body condition score, low body weight as a heifer. And then by the time she hits that older parity, she's basically gone to an animal that's high body weight, no surprise, but she's low body condition score. So what is going on with these older cows and how do we start to drill down on it? So that's kind of the findings. Um, and, uh, you know, that's, that's, that's it in a nutshell. Steve, do you kind of want to comment on the repro? Because you'd done that really elegant study a few years ago and this sort of beautifully complements the stuff you'd done uh, with Riati. Is that the right way to say the name? Um, back in you know, about 2018, I think. Yeah, that's. I mean, that that's been kind of a recurring question or interest for for me is um, this relationship between um, production and reproduction. You know, we often get the question about, you know, is are higher producing cows inherently harder to get pregnant? Do they, you know, do you have to at some point trade off between production and fertility? And um, you know, my I don't know my bias since since we're in the pub, I can just go straight to my bias as opposed to you know being completely scientifically objective for or at least trying to hang on to that for the first part of the conversation. But was that that you know that wasn't necessarily the case, and 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 the you know the data sets are are a bit few and far between, and 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 it, there's there's plenty of nuances, and it depends. But but um, I guess that the bottom line is it's not necessarily the case that there's um you know that it's harder to get higher producing cows pregnant but but i think coming back to what 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 we've shown or what ian's you know and, and helen have teased out of this these data um you know production and age get confounded to a point um but like for example in the work from this pool data that ian's been talking about um, it, the, the relationship's not linear between production and fertility. There, there seems to be a little bit of a sweet spot there. Um, and that's been shown somewhat in some other data sets. And, but fundamentally, I think what it comes back to, what, whether you sw swap in older cow and or higher producing cow, um, the, the challenge and the really interesting part is how, how do we support those cows? You know, people talk about the the analogy of the metabolic athlete or the you know the high producing cows like the race car not like the toyota and and so their their needs to be supported to do that elite level of performance and maybe to keep doing it for multiple lactations um are, are greater and so so our challenge as dairy scientists and managers and farmers is to figure out how to support those animals so that whatever their lifespan is 
ideally sort of determined by economics, it's um, it's supported in such a way that that when cows leave home, it's because we as managers make a decision for that, not that they so you know so to speak cull themselves or that we just can't can't find a way to support them anymore such that they stay healthy, stay fertile and stay productive. Stephen and Ian, do, do you think that, um, you know, given, I mean, th this is a big data set we've assembled from all over the place, but for the most part, it's one year uh, of data in these studies. And, you know, we, we're not able to follow cows from parity one to parity six or seven or whatever. And so I, I guess I'm just sitting here wondering if it's actually, because of culling bias, maybe it's an underestimate of the profound impact that, you know, the lack of metabolic adaptation has on, on reproduction, on cow health, on, on performance. Yeah, look, I, I really think that's the case, Todd. And the, the studies we're just going into with David Sheedy, who's one of the co-authors on you know the body condition score paper so so dave dave attacked the revision that that we did of that which was great um but you know the uh, you know i i still don't get a waffle graph sorry but you know you know he's, he's done this waffle graph and insisted it was better than the, you know the straight bar graph but anyway we can deal with it you that. have to put maple syrup on it to make it appetizing <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah it wasn't sweet for me anyway but <laughs> But I, I decided that you've got to you've got to concede, you know, you just got to let them have their head. But anyway, the the bottom line is that you know we're we're setting up um, thirty herds, fifteen intensive, fifteen at pasture, and we're going to kind of look at survival and performance and metabolomics in those herds, uh, and and try to to investigate that that in a prospective sense. Todd, we won't obviously for Dave's PhD, we can't go out. You know more than probably two three years at the most but you know we're going to have to look at that and uh you know hopefully a postdoc can take on a longer a longer interval but you know we are prospectively looking at it and we're looking at cohorts going forward where we're going to look at their metabolomic profiles and see you know see who who disappears basically we want to see who's going and why type thing so yeah it, 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 it's it's a pivotal question and nobody's asked it but it just seems so damned obvious well that, that's the thing right we all you know we're all all of us here um ian and todd and myself you know i guess we first got trained as veterinarians and second got trained as epidemiologists and you know along the way with nutrition and health and repro and, and a bunch of other things because we're sort of intellectually promiscuous but you know one of the first like you know kind of first or second month of epidemiology is is survivor bias right you have these these data sets whether they're they're humans and or, or, or cows as you you follow animals over time whether it's with you know repeated slices like we have or literally following the same individual over many years it is literally survivor bias Th those who stick around for a long time are not the same as those who leave early and and in the dairy world it's it gets even more confounded because sometimes it's because they're you know forced out so to speak if they get you know tough calving go lame have mastitis that they just don't recover from you know you could say well right that's that's genetic selection and and it's desirable that they should be removed from the population and yeah okay maybe um but but you know if that was an animal that genetically or otherwise could have been a really productive animal but she got mastitis because we didn't mad manage her environment well or she became lame or didn't get pregnant because of a of a human failing or a management failing that that gets really confounded but at the end of the day it's it's sort of baked into our data sets because we're, you know, we're not going to, I don't think we're going to find the farmer to do the natural experiment of saying, right, keep a whole bunch of your low producing cows, keep a bunch of your lame and mastitic cows, hang on to a bunch of chronically open cows because we'd really like to study them for a few years. I mean, I, I, yeah, I haven't, I haven't found a herd to volunteer for that study yet, but, but all that to say that, yeah, if, if anything, when we built in, we've got baked in survivor bias, when we try to 
make sense of who stays, who goes, or, or what's the nature or the needs of an older cow, um, yeah, we're, we're, we're probably only getting the, the tip of the iceberg there. Uh, and I, just to follow up on that, just from a, like thinking about culling, I, I, I think there, there's a misconception in a way, like we don't necessarily want cows to live forever because they're not necessarily gonna be profitable if they stay in the herd. That's yeah. not really what we're talking about. What we are talking about is that there's, there seems to be a lot of waste here because these cows are getting metabolic disease and, and crashing. And then the farmer is forced to call them, we presume, not making a decision that this heifer is going to be more profitable than this cow, right? So I think it's, it's really about trying to limit or reduce the force calls and trying to optimize the health and the performance of the, of the cows that we have. Right. So it's not it's not like let's have calves live to seven or eight lactations. That's not really it. It's trying it's to just shifting the curve a little to the right. You know, yeah. when I did some modeling around this to see what the impacts were, you know, it's not hard for us to get 16 percent more milk with a with a subtle shift to the right. And, you know, the greenhouse gas impacts of of keeping those cows just marginally longer and, you know, not having to rear quite as many heifers, take them into a dairy beef strategy, or, you know, you've got a lot of different strategies now that, that really open up efficiencies around sex semen and, you know, the, the, the whole bit. So if we can just get those cows to go that, that little bit longer, I mean, that was the thing that really, really shocked me was, you know, we were only talking about 9% um, getting through to that fifth or greater lactation. That's, that's incredibly low. Yeah. Again, and the other the other part of it, Ian, you just made me think of with the dairy beef is the is the cull cow value. So if you know if even even if um these cows still go like like we do um, change somehow our approach and and they're better metabolically, but maybe that heifer that's going to calve is still going to be better because of genetic improvements and whatever. We can still make money on deciding to get rid of these cows that are in good shape but i and we don't know it from our own data but the my presumption is that a lot of these cows are wrecks when they leave right they're thin maybe that they're they're salvage value cows rather than having some kind of reasonable meat value to them so i, I think there there is definitely economics in trying to impact these older cows yeah. And, you know, I, I think, Ian, you, you hit the word is optimized, right? And, and that's, and, and that there, there's, a, there's a win, win, win here that, that's kind of elusive, but, but what I think we're all after, which is the, you know, that economic optimization of cow's longevity, which isn't, like Todd said, I don't think is inherently that we just want, you know, older, older, older is somehow better because we depreciate the cow over a longer time, et cetera. It, it truly is about optimization. And, you know, for some cows that may be a shorter productive life and for some it may be longer, but, but I think for a lot of herds, you know, what, what Todd was saying, cows are culled not we're not necessarily culling healthy cows on on a purely selective and elective basis we get rid of the cows that you know kind of have to or or at least are, are you know the low-hanging fruit in the sense that they're they're you know they're lame or they've had disease or that we can't get them pregnant but you know oftentimes that's that's more so a, a failing of the two-legged animal than of the four-legged animal and so there's plenty of room to, to seek that optimum. And I think, yeah, from every standpoint, from economics, from animal health, um, from a welfare standpoint, yeah, we should be culling healthy cows, you know, that there's, there's enough, uh, that we're making those decisions on genetic merit, economic optimization, you know, optimization of herd structures and so on, as opposed to well, shoot, we just, you know, we just can't bear to keep her anymore. And, and so off she goes and, and, and the rest just follows from there. I think that's where we've got lots of upside um, opportunity to find that, that optimum that's a win-win for the, for the producer, for the herd, for the, for the cow herself. So how do you find that, that optimum? That, where, where does the dot go on the graph? 
Well, well, you know, I said we had training in veterinary medicine, epidemiology, some nutrition. Um, we got to add a side order of um, pretty hardcore economic modeling here. I mean, no, so I'm, I'm being serious but jokey at the same time. Like, uh, uh, not many, but but a number of people over the last you know a couple of academic generations have have done that around trying to optimize herd structures, optimize. Um, you know, when do you call a cow? And, and and even, you know, some of those are implemented in, in herd software to do estimates around that. It's not completely an academic exercise, um, but it but it does get complicated really quickly. But, you know, I think that the principle of it is a cow should stay in the herd until and unless you could replace her with an animal whose net present value, who, whose future worth over a reasonable expected lifetime is greater than the one you have today. I mean, that, so that's that's kind of cold and economical, but um, but but I think ultimately that's it. How do we get there? That's the that that's the intriguing but really tough challenge because that requires management and feeding and genetic selection and a whole bunch of stuff that you know we're all working on every day but that's kind of the elusive holy grail is how do you actually create the conditions on a farm so that cows can can actually be culled at that optimum time which you know for some cows that that are you know <laughs> You know that old saw about how every every person thinks their kids are better looking and smarter than average, and every driver thinks they're a better driver than average. Well, not every cow, even within her herd, is above average. There have to be some that are bringing down the herd's greenhouse gas intensity average, that are bringing down the herd's productivity average, and so they're candidates that maybe they ought to be replaced. And, and, and as things get better and pregnancy rates shift up and productivity shifts up, there's still always somebody, some cow, who's below the average. And so th those ought to be our candidates, but we got to create those conditions so that we could actually call on that basis as opposed to, well, gee, this cow could have, should have stayed, but we can't get her pregnant. This cow could have, should have stayed, for one or two or more extra lactations, but oh, yeah. Stephen, she's lame I, I, or she's too thin or she's what, you know, whatever else. Uh, Stephen, I, I, I think this is running into the Prairie Home Companion uh, model uh, where, you know, all the kids are above average. So, um, you know, <laughs> yeah. I, I think that's, I think that's kind of the right model, isn't it? Uh, yeah. But, but, you know, the points you make are, are really cool and, and profound and, and and you know the the thing that todd and i are kind of peripherally working on at the moment which is you know how do we make that cull cow a better cow um you know the beef market you know people forget just what a contribution the dairy cow makes to our beef supply chain and if we can get that cow in the better order as she leaves the herd you know that's going to be a big difference in terms of you know value of beef and quality of beef and you know you know yeah, I'm lucky enough to be involved with some pretty interesting meat science research, which I kind of fell into and never expected to be doing. But, um, you know, the, 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 the measures there are, is the consumer always consistently happy with the steak? And, you know, we're going to make that consumer more consistently happy with whatever we produce out of a better cull dairy cow. So, you know, it comes right back through that whole supply chain to where we're, you know, influencing every aspect of that from those sort of social license aspects to the kind of, you know, optimization for the farmer, the optimization for the cow, because hell, we all want really happy cows. I mean, you know, there's there's one thing that we would all, you know, compellingly agree on is that our goal is to make happy cows and those happy cows should make happy farmers. Yeah. Well, you know, and T Todd can maybe speak to this in a second. He's got some cool work going on exactly in the line you're talking about. But I think that's exactly it. If we can get to this sort of elusive but desirable thing of, of kind of a controlled, managed, selective, optimized culling paradigm, um, that then opens up some, you know, room to not be like, well, this cow's, you know, 
she's really got to go and she's kind of got to go, you know, today, tomorrow or this week, as opposed to saying, right, you know, we can really do this in an orderly, planned, methodical kind of way. And, you know, so her, her culling day could be next week or next month or in two months. And, um, you know, or, yeah, and that optimizes the quality of the animal who's leaving. And, and again, there's it's a real win-win, I think, if, if we can get there. Was there anything in the data that would show us, you know, what direction we need to go to, you know, change these cows' outcome? Uh, Maybe Todd should speak, but I, I, I think there's, you know, I think the metabolic data to me is the stuff that gives me the heads up. So that's what you know, I was going to say too. And I, and I think so. I, I was going to ask you this, Ian. It, it well, like, so heifers are different. That's pretty clear from, from the data and they have different problems too. And, and we should talk about that maybe. And, and then it seems like second lactation cows get a free pass. Like, like they just don't have a high level of incidence. And I, I've seen that over and over in our, in our smaller data sets that, that there's sort of a U-shaped curve where heifers get some disease, second calvers don't hardly get anything. And then, and then it goes up after that. So I'm, but then you also have to make this practical for the farm. Like they can't have 12 different diets. So, you know, do we, do we feed heifers and second calvers in the same cohort maybe? And, and then we target a, a different program somehow to deal with this metabolic challenge that these third plus cow, cows have. I, I'm just throwing that out. I mean, I don't know what the answer is, but I, but I wonder if we need to rethink it a little bit. There's a couple of couple of things that come out of that, and one of the things was a question out of the first out of the webinar we did, and and that was you know should we be feeding these cows differently? So you know I took our data and drilled down a bit on it, guys, and I've sent you a little bit of uh, that stuff, and maybe we can you know get that sent around via the via the team at Dalkem, but you know, without, you know, without, I guess, doing a full paper, but just, you know, show people some graphs, but, um, we could put, you know, there's, that in the show notes, Ian, if you'd like to, you know, put that someplace where it's accessible. Yeah, yep. that'd be cool. Um, but you know, the thing that was really interesting about that was that, you know, the, the later parity cows and I had to cut it at four, I think, they responded to the transition diet or the time on transition diet profoundly, you know, they, they were bumping up, you know, I think it was 0.3 of a kilo of solids or, you know, uh, let's think of how many pounds of milk it was. It was basically about 15, 16 pounds of milk, I think. And so, you know, they, the longer they spent on transition, the greater the, the productivity and that response was greater across those different parities. And, if you left a heifer on too long, it was detrimental. So, you know, you don't want to leave heifers on transition diets too long because it really, it really does mess with them. Whereas, you know, the older cow you could leave on 28 days and, you know, it'll, it'll do a really nice job for you in terms of increasing the milk production and the milk solids. So it's not just, you know, water. Um, so there's that. And I think, you, I think you're right, Todd. I, I mean, one of the things that I do practically when I'm formulating diets is I formulate ahead of the average cow. So I formulate for the cow that's doing, you know, about uh, eight pound more, um, you know, about that three to four or five kilos more of milk than the average cow. And I do that so that I, I feel like I should be um, trying to feed those higher producers and probably older cows better and that's a deliberate strategy and i know that it's a little unusual but that's that's what i've done over time and you know i don't know how you guys feel about that but that's you know one of my that's one of my things yeah i mean that that makes to me a, a lot of sense and, and you know it's it's interesting because you know in, in our world at least by u.s standards our, our dairies are, are fairly small and and so there's this opportunity as we figure out some of the science of the nutrition or other aspects of management around this 
Um, there'll be opportunities to implement this more for farms that are at larger scale. I mean, if they've got to have several close-up pens anyhow, just to make things work on the scale of a farm, I mean, ultimately that could come down to small to medium-sized dairies too. If, 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 you know, if we solidify the science and, and that changes some of our thinking around how to design transition facilities with, you know, with the ability to, to do that kind of tailoring, even if you're not milking 10,000 cows, but, but, you know, for now, that is one of the challenges, but I, I think that's going to be, you know, people call it precision feeding, whatever that, that usually means more the individual than, but, but I think we could, there, there's, there's opportunities there. Yeah. Even thinking about dividing things out by parity to meet nutritional needs, but, but also social and, and other things. So, you know, like thinking about time on the, in the close up that that's not even necessarily with a different diet, although that, that would probably take it a, a step further if we could do both. How about needs that surrounding, um, you know, stall size or um, stocking density based on bigger, older cows? You know, we may just need to have different standards, you know, for that third and greater lactation cow. Yeah, it's an interesting point because, you know, in Australia, we don't have a huge number of intensive herds. And I think what we're doing is we're heading very much towards um, some loose barn type, you know, compost packed barns. And I think that gives you the, the cows a lot more flexibility about how they lie and where they lie. And, you know, we haven't got them quite perfect yet, but we're moving, you know, really quickly on trying to get that right. And I think we're going to jump a technology on, the, on, on you know, sort of the U.S., you know, I know Canada's had some pretty interesting loose barn designs over time um, as well. So, you know, they've, they've done those sort of deep straw pack barns. Um, and, uh, you know, the, I always thought the cows look really comfortable there. And certainly we seem to have very happy cows. And I think that I think that's one area that takes the pressure off. I'm, you know, I've got to be honest, I'm not a great freestall fan. I mean, well done. done. They're, they're fantastic and love them. But. You know they're they're a hard they're they're a difficult barn to to keep in order and uh, you know that that precision not every farm can achieve that precision so it does place pressure on you know hock injury and all those sorts of things that you know you're kind of alluding to. Peter, I think just to follow up on Yin's comments, I think you made an excellent point because we. We've been focusing a little bit on nutrition and and probably there's um maybe even more importance on on management factors so for sure i think space is a, a massive um influencer on 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 metabolic disease um at least we think so i mean it's not always proven so far in science but uh, certainly in some of the big herd problems that we see um commonly space and access to whether it's stalls or feed or, or, you know, density of animals in a pen or whatever seems to be important and seems to resolve sometimes when you create that space. So I do think, I do think that's important. Um, maybe as an industry, perhaps a really good example of success is if anyone's been to Israel, I mean, they have, those cows have tons of space. Um, there's other issues there, but, but the cows sure do well. And I, I don't know. I mean, that's, that's not science. That's just observation. Um, just the other thing I, I think that's really important that we haven't really investigated very closely, and I've got a, a paper under review and another one that is just published on um, some work we did on the transition cow assessment tool uh, from Canadian dairy herds that, you know, Lanco has this tool and yeah, it's survey data and it's cross-sectional, but the one thing that really came out in that and, and it's come out in both pieces of work is water, water access. Like, I, I don't know if we have enough water access for these cows and, and maybe that's even more important for the, you know, the mature, older Holsteins than it is for, like, I'm sure it's important for everybody, but I just uh, throw that out as well. It's another thought. Yeah. Are there certain herds or certain localities that are able to support older cows that we could learn from, study from and say, what is different about this dairy or this location in the world that allows them to have older cows. I, I can't think of one myself, but um, you know, that's just my limited United States experience. 
Well, Todd was mentioning Israel. I was in Israel two weeks ago, and we were at a dairy and <clears throat> uh, with a group of, of folks from, from Europe, and they were asking the dairy farmer, you know, what's your average uh, lactation length? And he said, you know, four to five years. And one of the Europeans piped up and said, well, why so short? And so uh, I, I think at least their expectations, at least from that one gentleman, that one data point, is that perhaps uh, they've got uh, older cows within their herds. I don't know, just an anecdotal story there to share. We've descended into anecdote here, so what the heck. But no, I, I think, you know, you know, anecdotally, but perhaps also correctly, I think, you know, most of us and people in the field would say, you know, the herds that are able to perhaps get closer to that optimization of herd structure and have cows live as long as they could or should from a, not as long as they could possibly live, but as long as they could, you know, be productive members of their society, their herd. Um, and 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 not be forced out it, it's it's a lot to do around that that cow comfort and transition management because that's where things sort of make it or don't make it right it, it, what 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 trips things up is if we can't safely get cows through the the calving period um and or they you know succumb to um smoldering accumulated issues around lameness or or that kind of thing and so th those herds like todd said generally are giving those cows abundant space for feeding and lying because that really creates a buffer for other variables um and they've they've achieved by different means but they've achieved um, a high level of cow comfort right so they whether that's a pack barn or a freestall barn with well-designed, well-bedded stalls. I think it, it comes back to that um, simple stuff, but not necessarily easy stuff. Yeah, I, I think that emphasis on the transition is, is so right because, you know, when we look at the removals, you know, I think it's about 4% of the removals occur in that immediate periparturian period. And then, you know, you can probably look out to about 70 days and say, you know, another significant percentage are going then so you know if you look at that stuff that jose and i did on the uh, you know the meta-analyses around um the impacts of negative vcat diets i mean that that's pretty profound in terms of improvement and you know again the the stuff i was kind of looking at um you know and that data is not perfect but this isn't you know a perfect data show right um around those that time on transition you know, the time on transition, you know, even even the body weights seem to be better with, you know, uh, more time on transition. So, you know, it, it was basically around, a, a, you know, a kilo a day um, benefit for those older cows. So I think I think, you know, that that needs to be a, a really intent focus. And I guess from the from the additive or the, the fiddle side of nutrition, you know, this is where you can justify putting in some extra dollars. And, you know, that that to me is, you know, a no brainer. If we can bring down that that percentage of cows removed, if we can increase the fertility, you know, things like fats, you know, there's there's really good evidence and you know, some of the you know, some of the support for the methyl donor type areas. Um, you know, that that stuff, you know, the colines and the you know, the better quality protein meals that are used in DCADs, they're all tools that I think give us give us good directions forward around that that transition cow. So and particularly, you know, what seems to be very evident from that data is that those older cows are going to pay you back for that additional support. So, you know, I think there's pretty compelling evidence around that as an intervention that makes a difference. But, Hey, I, I, I thought I'd lob a hand grenade in today and, and, and because I know both of you know this area intently, I, um, I, I'm going to ask a question that I think is somewhat provocative, but, but do we think that subclinical ketosis matters if what we've got, <laughs> if, if, if what we've got is a really profound confounding with older cows? And I, I'm just wondering about that because that was one of the questions that sort of came out of looking at the metabolic data is, oh, I wonder if 
what we've been looking at is the older cow predominantly and not some impact of subclinical ketosis. And, you know, it just sort of really was in my face. So I thought I'd ask the question. <laughs> I know, uh, you know Todd, a, Todd, Todd and Stephen both love it. No, I, I, I won't take my gloves off. It's okay. <laughs> um, I, so the answer is yes, I think it's important. I, I and, and we haven't done maybe a perfect job with it, but most studies have attempted to deal with parity, albeit, you know, parity one or parity one and greater, or I think in the case of our work, it's parity one, two, and three in, in some of our in some of our work. So we have tried to address parity in those models and and we've tested for interactions on health outcomes. And I would say for the most part we haven't found interactions. So I so I still think so here's here's the way I would explain it. If you're a parity six animal, you're far more likely to get ketotic and probably hypocalcemic and get a DA and everything else. And if you're a parity one animal, you're not very likely to get it. But if you get it, it doesn't really matter your parity, you're still more likely to get metritis and DA and whatever else. And so, I, yes, I do think it's important, um, you know, but given what we know, at least on some farms, I wouldn't say all farms, but on some farms, if you were wanting to do a monitoring program for ketosis, let's say, you know, perhaps you could, for the most part, ignore parity one animals. Now, I wouldn't say that's true on every farm because there are some farms that have, you know, massive problems in heifers, but that's likely nutritional and management factors related to heifer rearing. Um, anyway, that's, so that's my stab at trying to answer your question. Go ahead, Stephen, you can try. Yeah, and, and, you know, I, I would, you know, we, we've well. T Todd knows because I I invited or coerced him into into debating this at least once publicly in the past. But you know, is ketosis a disease? And uh, you know, okay, if you want to split a hair, maybe it's it's a risk factor or a risk category. Um, and you know, the epidemiologic evidence is pretty solid that it, you know, depending on the threshold, etc., there there is definitely an an association. That as cows have higher blood or milk BHBs, they they start um, kicking up into a higher risk category for undesirable stuff, other clinical diseases, not getting pregnant, ultimately making less milk than they probably could have or would have otherwise. Um, it's not their fate, you know. It, it's not that every cow above X threshold is, you know, going to have badness ensue um and the other thing too is that that um where i think we're getting a little more sophisticated about it so to a point ketosis is adaptive but at a certain point it's not adaptive anymore and and it becomes a uh, if not an inherent causal mechanistic problem it's it's a it's a state of risk um and an indicator directly or indirectly of some metabolic processes that aren't adaptive anymore. They're, they're going into a, an undesirable um, state. You know, but the other thing is there's some work, I mean, you know, we'd shown this uh, at the Royal We, some of our grad students and so on, but, and others have shown this as well. We can get more, we can put nuances on it. We can get a little more precise, a little more subtle. So for example, um, if we look not only at ketosis based on a blood test, but also blood glucose levels at the same time, that looks to be a, a useful additional um, nuance to put on things. So cows that are both ketotic and have low blood glucose at the time um, really do look to be a different sort of animal. They don't respond as well. Their, their outcomes are worse and so on and so forth. Um, you know, there's some interesting work coming out of Minnesota right now or recently uh, around looking at early lactation milk and ketosis. And, and, you know, that really is a bit of a chicken and egg, like cows that are both low producing in week one and have ketosis have worse outcomes than cows that are higher producing yet or and ketotic in week one. But, you know, before we talked about the confounding of, 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 you know, survivor bias in older cows, well, I think there's an analogy there, like, are they lower producing 
because they're ketotic? Are they ketotic, you know, because they have a series of other things in their life, a tough calving, et cetera, et cetera, that um, cause them to be both low producing and ketotic? Conversely, you know, can, can we find the cow that is has a blood BHB above X yet makes tons of milk? Absolutely. Um, but again, we're, we're looking for things that are useful in the field, not necessarily completely predictive or deterministic at the individual animal, nor are they necessarily speaking to very direct causal pathways. Um, we're talking about categories of risk that are useful in the field. Um, I think that's an important distinction. Yeah, just and just to pick up on that a little bit, like um, the evidence, like so, confounding issues and and um, you know time ordering issues aside, I, I and again now I'm speculating a little bit because the data is weaker, but I I would suggest it might matter when the cow is ketotic that the, that there's data out there in a bunch of different yeah. studies where you see different effects depending on the days in milk when that cow is identified as being ketotic. So I, I, I do think it matters. I think yeah. earlier in lactation is worse yeah. generally. Um, and, and we're seeing the same thing out of some of the Cornell work with hypocalcemia. It matters when that cow is hypocalcemic, what, what happens to her. And right? for how long, right? And, and for how long. And, and those are the kind of nuances that we, we didn't have the luxury of being able to evaluate in this data set because it just we just don't have uh, that level of detail. But um, you know, so that's work to come, I guess, down the road. I guess, I guess some of that leads into this issue around inflammation versus hypocalcemia, and I don't see them as being mutually exclusive at all. And right. and and uh, we make that point in the papers, and 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 you know, I think that's that's really important though to to just look at the profound if you know associations with high with the hypocalcemia in this data, and you'd start to go, wow. This thing is really, really important. So the question I've got is, you know, what is that process that's taking that cow into a less responsive space as it's older? And, you know, one of the things I think we're going to have to look really, really hard at is, is re-accretion and, and, and getting calcium balance back. Because if I look at, you know, the difference between the heifer and the cow, you know, one of the things is that the heifer's had two years to accrete calcium and get bone structure right. And this whole axis between uh, energy, protein, and bone, it, it, it's really important. And the more we drill down into that area, the, you know, the, the the more important that looks. And I'm hoping that uh, Megan Connolly, who's, you know, we're working with with Laura Hernandez, um, you know, I'm hoping that you know some of the stuff we're going to get out of that in the time series um, stuff that we're working on is going to help us understand who's on first and what's on second you know because you know we we you know we've got that whole thing around uh you know serotonin we got the the stuff around uh you know calcium metabolism we got the stuff around energy metabolism it's all very dynamic but we need to know who's moving first to give us an idea of the priorities as to where we set and and, and really tweak our transition and, and uh, you know, to me, I, I think that really starts back at, at, at peak lactation because that re-accretion of body tissues is, is pivotal to what happens in the next calving. And, you know, if we look at, if we look at this in a, in a cyclic way, as you guys were saying earlier, and what, look longitudinally, what is happening to those tissue pools and, and bone you know, being an important tissue pool, much more important than when I kind of graduated. Like when I graduated, I just thought bone was like wood wood pegs, you know, which probably shows why, you know, I, I never became an orthopedic person. Um, but, you know, <laughs> bottom line is that, you know, it's a, it's a dynamic and important tissue and we've kind of ignored, you know, what are the needs of bone and how does it re-accrete? Because, you know, I think there was earlier work that said, you know, they don't re accrete bone until, you know, sort of day 230 of lactation. Well, you know, I'm not sure that that's true anymore. You know, we're talking about cows doing, you know, uh, 10,000 pounds more than when those studies were done. And, you know, um, that's a lot more calcium going out. 
And, you know, I've looked at some diets. You know, one of the herds that had high rates of removal, for some reason, had a had a 0.7% calcium on, you know, cows that are doing, you know, 50 liters, uh, you know, as, as a sort of a big fresh string average. So, you know, they're, what, 120 pound, you know, in a very, very big herd. But, you know, like they're, they're you know, for some reason, their dietary calcium was 0.7%. Well, I don't think that's going to cook it. You know, it's not going to get there. So I think that whole area uh, around, you know, bone bone management needs to go up a notch in terms of our focus as nutritional advisors. I mean, I mean, it's interesting, Ian, because, you know, like when I first started in this area, we were talking nutritionally about close-up diets, you know, and, and then, you know, Drackley's work predominantly led us to think about, you know, not giving too much energy in the early part of the dry period in particular. And so now all of a sudden we're thinking about preparing that cow for lactation at dry off. But what you're proposing is that, well, wait a second, we should really be preparing that cow for dry off when she becomes pregnant, which to me is a completely different thought process. Like, like we traditionally think about getting milk out of those cows. We're not thinking about how they're going to do in the next lactation, right? And and maybe that's the shift that we need to to have in our thinking. There's some stuff that 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 I wish I had another lifetime. <laughs> um, but particularly around understanding the energetics and the protein metabolism at at the at the maximal, you know, uh, at the vertex, if you like, of production. And subsequent to that, so we basically mobilize fat over around the first 20 some days. We mobilize the protein over about the first 14. And then we have a point where there's no reaccretion. But once we get into the reaccretion phase, the, the metabolic efficiencies with which we do that are really different in my view to later. And, you know, we need to look at that area. And, you know, unfortunately it probably requires some some nasty type studies like some slaughter studies, serial slaughter studies to kind of understand that. But, you know, and, and, and you know, if, 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 of course, we were all born a little bit earlier, we could have done those isotope type studies. Um, but now that's, that's a little difficult to do. So, um, you know, that whole area, though, we don't understand. Like there is an abject lack of data around that peri- peak period and the reoccurring phase and you know and extend i mean the big players we don't understand you know so we don't understand the energy and we don't understand the protein reaccretion but what we also don't understand is that roll of bone and so you know we got the we got the big three sitting there that we just we've we've got a bit of a blank space and we're kind of saying well she'll be right but these older cows clearly it ain't right you know then they're, they're not regaining that body condition that we need for those to perform. And, you know, they're, they're under more pressure than they should be because we're not just getting that right. And again, putting on a dirty clinician's hat, you know, when I look at those older cows, you kind of look at them and you go, that body condition just ain't right. You know, it's, it's lacking muscular definition. It's lacking that fill between the hooks and the pins. And, you know, I hate to say it, but across the thurls, um, <laughs> you know, all those areas just did, you know, the definition on those cows just is not right. And so that's, that's, that, that kind of, they're all just hints that we need to look. Yeah. So Ian, how, how much of that, um, because here's, here's another observation from the data for me is that, um, you know, not only are those older cows, um, lower in body condition, but they're also getting higher in lameness. And and, and I know it, it, it's not necessarily causal, but it sure is an intriguing observation. You, you have to wonder how much role that lack of digital cushion, presumably in less conditioned cows, is playing in the in the outcomes that we see in lameness in these cows. Yeah. No, I, you know, I mean, I, I think it's it's worth mentioning here that, you know, this level of 
physiologic philosophy coming from someone who's only at seven in the morning and and, and only drinking coffee while the rest of us are <laughs> trying to fuel our creativity other ways. I mean, this this is why we admire Ian and and seek opportunities to work with him. But but you know, to be somewhat <laughs> serious. Uh, no, I, I think that's exactly, you know, when, when you think about, you know, the level of sophistication we think we have when, in, in thinking about dairy cows diets and how to support their lactations and maybe their fertility and their health and so on. But yeah, I, I think there's an opportunity here to kind of um, come back to, to yeah, rethinking some of those paradigms, exactly like Ian's saying, I mean, <laughs> you know, I, speaking as a person who's only, um, you know, 29 with a few years of experience you know obviously you know we, we we can all relate to the ravages of age here a little bit um but uh um you know yeah thinking about how, how we could change that paradigm a little bit back to the notion of how do we support cows to stick around in a healthy productive fertile way until such time as their economic time or their herd structure time is up and i think like what ian's pointed out here is there's some opportunities to maybe rethink some of our nutritional paradigms um, in terms of supporting reaccretion of protein, bone metabolism, and so on that, you know, we maybe just haven't thought about that or thought about things in, in that way. And it's, again, it's, it's like, we've talked about a few chickens and eggs here. Um, but, but that might be another one is, you know, I'm not saying cows get osteoporosis the way old people do, but you know, it's the, the, the chicken and the egg was a bit of like, well, we don't really have to concern ourselves with that too much because cows just don't live that long. Well, if we don't concern ourselves with that at all, that perhaps they won't live that long. So, you know, I'm exaggerating to make a point, but, um, but I do think there's a real opportunity there. Yeah. Yeah. yeah Stephen, I think that's a, yeah, go ahead, Ian. Oh, it's just going to say Todd, you know, with those cull cows, I think you've got a really good opportunity to to have a look at those digital pads too when you you know when you when you're doing those ones because i'm I'm sure that a reasonable number of those cull cows will be pretty lame and and uh, it'd be interesting just to have a look at those digital pads at day, the same time as you're doing some of the other stuff. Yeah. Gentlemen, I don't know if you noticed, but they just flicker the lights. That means it is last call. <clears throat> so i'm I'm going to order another. Uh, another scotch uh why don't we just get a whole round for everybody else but with that what i'd like to do is ask each of you to kind of give us one or two key takeaways from the discussion uh, that we've had this afternoon tonight's last call question is brought to you by nitrosure precision release nitrogen nitrosure delivers a complete tmr for the rumen microbiome helping you feed the microbes that feed your cows to learn more about maximizing microbial protein output while reducing your carbon footprint, visit balcom.com slash nitrosure. And uh, uh, Todd, why don't we start with you? Sure. Um, I, I guess um, the, the, the data that um, we've been talking about um, to me shows there's all kinds of things to talk about, but it, it definitely shows that there's a big difference between heifers and, and older cows. And, and I think um, we need to really rethink what that means in terms of both the management of those cows and the, and the feeding of those cows uh, moving forward to try to improve their health and welfare. Um, I, I guess that's my big take home. I don't know if there, there's all kinds of second things. I, I, I suppose the other thing, given I'm doing the cull cow research that Ian just alluded to is that um, I think the value might be not only in um, perhaps being able to retain these cows in the herd a bit longer if, if they're productive and it's economical to do so, but also um, having better valued cull cows um, at the end of the day that also improves welfare, improves some um, consumer acceptability of, of uh, the industry potentially and um, has consumer value in terms of meat quality. Very well. Peter, what say you? I think there's some opportunity here to obviously to look at these things and see if we can't, uh, you know, make a change. I think the, you know, we, the numbers are profound and, and uh, the economic value is profound and, and we can't be lost upon the effect that uh, uh, what this could have upon our, you know, our markets, our consumer. So uh, I look forward to uh, what uh, these folks can come up with and, and what direction we should be heading to, uh, you know, try to make this impact on the on the industry. 
All right. Thanks, Pete. And Stephen, what kind of final words do you have for us? Um, yeah, I guess two. Um, one, one is on the on the cow side of things, and and that is, you know, again, I'll I'll kind of reiterate or double down on. We're not inherently just trying to have old cows around, but but I think our challenge um, is to find ways to support cows so that you know every cow eventually becomes a cull cow, but but that she should have a. a as he said before, a happy life and a healthy life, right up to and including uh, the end. And that, that one of our challenges, both from management and nutrition, is to find ways to support that so that cows leave. Yeah, I, I don't think there's any, we don't need to shy away from saying at an economically optimized time, but that they're, that they stay healthy and productive up to and including that point. Uh, and I think that's our challenge. And there's some some really cool deep physiology around that, but there's also some very pragmatic um, management that that's um, for today as opposed to over the horizon. And the second part, I guess I'll just kind of go back to the two-legged animals, but the ones that are uh, gathered in the virtual pub here today and say that, you know, that this to me is some of the beauty and, and the fun of of being in this, uh, that, that's somebody responding to a heart attack for an old uh, dairy cow researcher who may not be with us anymore. But, um, you know, th this is the fun of our world and, and, and our work, I think, is, is meeting and, and, and forming friendships with, uh, with people who are like-minded and share a passion for cows and might enjoy a drink together uh, occasionally when we get the opportunity and and that that to me is one of the really fun parts about this there's there's cows all over the world uh, and really interesting people all over the world to talk about them with so thanks for the opportunity tonight yeah very welcome dr lean I'll give you the final word <laughs> well steve steve stole one of my points which is just you know grateful to you know all my co-authors and uh you know, Todd, Stephen, Jose, Helen, and Dave, um, you know, they've all just been, you know, fantastic collaborators. It's It's been a joy to do this this thing. I, you know, I, I, I got to confess, there was the times where we were dealing with some fairly difficult stats where I, I must admit I was probably uh, belting my head against a brick wall, just getting gently through those, uh, those, those, those fairly complex moments. But, uh, gee, you know, it's been rewarding. You know, I, I think for me, the take home is we kind of knew these older cows were in trouble, right? Um, you know, we had evidence particularly around the repro and, you know, we've, we've, we've sort of been looking at it and, you know, inherently we've known about, you know, the difference in hypocalcemia over time. But I think for me, it was the quantification of it and just to see those numbers and they're so in your face um, that, that, you know, we know we've got to do something and we know it's actually genuine research. Um, and we've, you know, we're going into areas that we just don't know. And one of the things we've given, I think, the producers and, you know, the consultants and the, the people who are listening who, you know, make differences on farms, you know, a few things to go with. But, you know, to be honest, um, we've reinforced the value of transition. We've reinforced, reinforced the value of cow comfort. Um, but there's things that, you know, are sitting there that are questions I've got. You know, how young can we possibly calve something? How can we feed it better so that that trajectory starts at peak lactation? And we've, we're, we're targeting ideal body condition score and, and more because body condition scores are fairly uh, obtuse measure. You know, it just doesn't really get to the hub of what we need in terms of those those mobilizable nutrients. And we need to understand those mobilizable nutrients as pools that are available for that next lactation to make that animal safe and sound and happy. So, you know, we've given people a few heads up, but there's a hell of a lot more work to do. And I guess that's 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 exciting for all the young scientists watching. And, you know, I think the lesson that they could take home is that you know, collaboration's wonderful. You know, you can have some good ideas, but, you know, if you've got good colleagues, it's even better. Um, so, you know, that's that's probably my thoughts for the day. And uh, sorry, Jose couldn't make it because I know he'd have added real value. And Helen's also uh, having a few days off. So, you know, we didn't have her in. So, you know, just appreciate those colleagues' work. 
Yeah. Well, thank you for those words, Ian. You know, this is a, a subject I've been wanting to, to cover for a while. And so uh, it was fortuitous that I bumped into you at uh, actually it was at Jose's party in the pub there in, at the ADSA. So uh, I appreciated that and I'm glad we made the connection. This has been very interesting. You brought a couple great guests with you today. This has been a very engaging conversation. I hope uh, the audience is, is enjoying it as much as I do. Gentlemen, you've been great. I uh, look forward to having you guys back to the pub at any time. You're welcome anytime. Um, and as always, I want to thank our, our loyal listeners. Uh, you know, hope you learned something. I hope you had fun and hope to see you next time here at the Real Science Exchange where it's always happy hour and you're always among friends. We'd love to hear your comments or ideas for topics and guests. So please reach out via email to anh.marketing at balchem.com with any suggestions and we'll work hard to add them to the schedule. Don't forget to leave a five-star rating on your way out. You can request your Real Science Exchange t-shirt in just a few easy steps. Just like or subscribe to the Real Science Exchange and send us a screenshot along with your address and t-shirt size to anh.marketing at balchem.com. Balchem's Real Science Lecture Series of webinars continues with ruminant-focused topics on the first Tuesday of every month, monogastric-focused topics on the second Tuesday of each month, and quarterly topics for the companion animal segment. Visit balchem.com slash real science to see the latest schedule and to register for upcoming webinars.